हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between two people about a flat. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. This is Simon Marshall. I spoke to you the other day about renting flat 3A. Oh yes. Hello Simon. What can I do for you? Well, there are a few health and safety things I'd like to run through if that's okay. Yes, fine. Right. Well, the first thing, bearing in mind it's quite an old house, is whether there's any damp. I'm thinking here of the exterior walls and the floor. Well, I've never known any problems with damp there. It was all right last time I checked, certainly, though that was before the recent wet weather. I'd better have another look and get back to you on that. Okay. Now the next thing is the gas supply. Do you have a safety certificate, a current one that is? We do. All the gas appliances have been checked by a registered engineer. Yes, I was going to ask about that. When did they actually do the inspection? Let me think. They sent an engineer to check something early last year, but no, that wasn't the inspection. Oh, I remember now it was in the spring. In fact, I've got the certificate here somewhere. Yes, that's it. March 22nd, so it's just over 5 months ago. And the electricity When was the last time all the wiring was inspected? I know it doesn't have to be checked as often as the gas, but it's still important, especially in older properties. As it happens, we had an electrician in when we redecorated flat 3A. If he looked at everything then, he would have charged us for it. I'll find the bill and check it if you like. Fine. And when was that? Uh the decorators finished just before Easter so that would be about 18 months ago. Mhm. Mm just one more point on the electrics. Are there enough plug sockets in the flat? It depends what you mean by enough really. Well, I've got quite a lot of electrical things, computer, radio, lamps, kitchen appliances and so on and I'm wondering whether I could plug them all in without having cables trailing all over the place. I think there's one per room. That's fairly normal in older properties. <laughs> I'll take that as a no then. <laughs> all right. Now, another safety point. Is there a smoke alarm? Yes, there's one in the kitchen. And is it in good working order? I'll have to try it out and let you know. Right. Now you mentioned the previous tenants. Do they or anyone else who's lived in the flat still have keys to the door? We're very strict about that. Everyone has to hand back the keys when they leave or we don't return the deposit. And those in 3A have always done so. mentioned a room where people can leave things like suitcases and bags and things where exactly is that is it next to 3A which i take it is on the third floor 
Well, the apartment's on the third, yes. But the storeroom's a little way away, just past the second door to the right. Under the stairs, in fact. But it's on the same floor, isn't it? Yes, it is. Fine. Now, another thing I wanted to check is that there's hot water in the apartment. Oh, yes. It runs off the central heating. That was installed back in the 70s, I think, so there's a permanent supply. Hmm, but is it really hot? Not just warm or lukewarm? I suppose it depends what you mean by hot. But it's at a constant 60 degrees. Oh, that sounds fine. Yes, it used to be set at 55, but last year the tenants asked us to increase it, so we did. Oh, I'm glad about that. OK, now can you tell me a bit about the yard and the garden? How big are they? Well, the yard at the side of the house is about 20 square metres. Oh, so there's room for my motorbike then. Actually, it's only a 50cc moped, but I like to keep it off the road at night. Yes, there's more than enough space there, even with all the wheelie bins. And the garden? That's much bigger, about 150 square metres. Mm -hmm. um, who looks after it, by the way? Old Mr Collins. He's almost 90, but he's out there every day. Uh -huh. And the last point, the TV. What size screen is it? It's 70 centimetres wide, I think. No, sorry, that was the old one. This one's 80. You can get 90-odd channels on it, so I'm told. Really? So there's a satellite dish on the roof, is there? No, it's cable TV here. It doesn't cost much between everyone, though. Ah, that's very interesting. OK, thanks for your help. I'll be in touch again soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a news broadcast on a radio station. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the news broadcast and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome to 2RC, your local radio news service for the Wesley area. And here are your headlines for this morning. More news from the police into the jewellery robbery that occurred last Tuesday in the centre of town. Comtech, the local computer hardware manufacturer, has announced that it must cut 40 jobs. New routes open up at the Wesley International Airport. Plans for the redevelopment of the Oakley Woods have been shelved. A local cricket team make it to the regional finals. And get set for a heat wave. First of all, police have released two descriptions for the two men wanted in connection with the robbery at the local jewellery store, Nichols, in the centre of town last Tuesday. At 9am, just when the store was opening, two men burst through the door and demanded bags to be filled up with jewellery. Although the two men were armed with baseball bats, the shopkeepers bravely attacked them and beat them off. Although the two men had motorcycle helmets on, these were knocked off during the scuffle, and the shopkeepers were able to get a good look at them. The first man is said to be about six foot in height, slight build, dark hair and a small moustache. He was wearing blue jeans, a white t-shirt and a black leather jacket. The second man is much shorter, around 5 foot 8, with a fat build and red hair and clean shaven. 
He was wearing a dark blue sweater and black jeans. They are both probably in their early twenties. The police hope to issue photo fit pictures later today. The public are urged to call Wesley Police if they think they recognise either of the two men. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the news broadcast and answer questions 16 to 20. Comtech last night announced that they must release 40 workers. This was blamed on a downturn in sales and increased competition. The jobs to be lost will be a mixture of early retirement offerings and a spread from all departments in the company. Westley International Airport has been awarded by Cheap Air, the new low-cost carrier, four new routes into Europe. The new routes will be into four European countries, though the details have not yet been released. When the deals have been finalised, this will lead to a significant number of jobs. Environmentalists were delighted this morning by the news that plans by the local council to develop the Oakley Woods area have been shelved. The woods were to have been developed into a shopping area, but opposition from local residents and local environmental groups has led to a turnaround by the local council and they will now look for an alternative site. Westley Green, a local pressure group, says they are ecstatic that the council has bowed to the wishes of people in the area. Mr George Finchley, Mayor of Westley, made the announcement and said that the committee responsible took all available information into account before taking the decision and he hopes that Westley residents are happy that the local council are sensitive to their wishes when making decisions. East Moors CC, a local league cricket club, has made it to the finals of the Sunday League knockout cricket competition. They will play the final at home on Sunday 30th of August against Newbury CC. Go along and support if you're around that day, as you'll be assured a great Sunday afternoon sport. And finally, get set for a heatwave for the remainder of the month of August. Weather experts have assured us that we will have three weeks of unbroken sunshine till the end of the month. Great news, but those of us who are experienced with the British weather will most likely greet this news with, let's wait and see. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two students talking about the MOA with the lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Thank you all for coming here today to hear about the moa, a kind of animal which has been extinct for a long time. Well, first of all, we look at what the moa are. The moa are nine species of flightless birds endemic to New Zealand. 
They were the dominant herbivores in New Zealand's forest, shrubland and subalpine ecosystems for thousands of years. But around 500 years ago, they all went extinct. When I mention extinct animals during ancient times, you may immediately think of dinosaurs, which disappeared around 66 million years ago. Fossils of dinosaurs, which we use to study, are large in number, but not many of those of Moa remain, though both animals appeal to people today. So, the Moa sound more mysterious now, but sir, I've got a question about these flightless birds. How can we distinguish them from other birds? That's a good question. Birds are commonly characterized by being warm-blooded, having feathers and wings, usually capable of flight, and laying eggs, while the flightless moa, until their extinction, were the largest birds in the world. Their heads are relatively small in relation to their bodies, and they are the only wingless birds lacking even the vestigial wings and substantial tail bones in their family. That's impressive, but were they born to be like that? I mean, when they were chicks? Yes, absolutely. So let's move on to the chicks. The eggs of moa were laid in nests and incubated for about two months. The chicks would be well developed upon hatching and probably would be able to leave the nests to feed on their own almost immediately. I've heard that the male moa are thought to have incubated the eggs. Is that true? I think there is a possibility for that. I've read somewhere that the sex-specific DNA recovered from the outer surfaces of eggshells suggested that these eggs were likely to have been hatched by the male, but we still need to consult more. But I have a question. There has been some occasional speculation that the moa were still alive, because someone said they had caught sight of them in New Zealand in the late 19th century, or even the 20th. Do you think it's possible? I'm not amazed by that, since that kind of thing has been claimed several times. But I find it funny, because no reliable evidence of moa tracks has ever been found, and experts still contend that moa survival is extremely unlikely. So what was the reason for the moa's extinction? I wonder if it was global warming or some other factors related to their living environment. Well, before the arrival of human settlers in New Zealand, the moa's only predator was the massive Haas eagle. Then the Maori arrived sometime before CE 1300, and all moa genera were soon driven to extinction by hunting. What a horrible thing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 27 to 30. All right, now let's look at the features of some species of moa. The South Island giant moa may have been the tallest birds ever known. And the second tallest of the nine moa species is the North Island giant moa, with the females being markedly larger than males, both in weight and height. And I've heard that the smallest of the moa birds are the coastal moa. Is that right? Yes, you were right. And have you heard about any other kind of moa before? I know the crested moa. The eggs they laid may be larger than others. As they mainly lived in the remote interior of the southern island, their fossils are rare or absent in archaeological sites, and no egg remains have yet been identified. Are there any species of moa that have got more fossils? Yes, of course. A considerable amount of remains of the stout-legged moa exist due to the well-preserved properties of their habitat. Their skulls reveal relatively bad vision, a good sense of smell, and a very short bill. Then there is the eastern moa. They were remarkable in having very long and narrow windpipes, which probably enabled them to make louder, more resonant calls than those of other moa, and had the greatest vocal abilities so they could communicate when they could not see each other in the forest or at night. They used a range of senses, apart from sound in their search for food, such as their sense of smell and vision. 
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how, with time, we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space, or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter. A scientific unit is only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government, since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. So, now I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. 
In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock, or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple concept, the slow and consistent nature of a burning wax candle. By utilising this process, our ancestors were able to keep steady track of the time. The clocks were created by engraving the length of the candle with evenly spaced markings. Each marking represented a single unit of time, and, as the wax burned down, each hour would disappear. However, the drafts and the variable quality of the wax mainly influenced the time of burning. Like oil lamps, candles were used to mark the passage of time from one event to another rather than tell the time of day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll submit some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking. You got guesswork. Please, guys, participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.